How do we define success? Can your life be seen as successful? Even if you don't make a huge impact on history. If you fade into obscurity and all that we remember about you is maybe one or two facts, do you have an impact on, his on history? Well, welcome to Mr. H on YouTube. Today launches a new series called Weird Biography. And uh, our first one today is going to be about our President William Henry Harrison, our ninth president, and his life, his death, and did he make an impact on the history of the United States. So if you haven't already, go ahead and like and subscribe to Mr. H on YouTube, and we will get started with William Henry Harrison. at Berkeley Plantation, the Harrison family home along the James River in Charles City County, Virginia. He was a member of a prominent political family of English descent whose ancestors had been in Virginia since the 1630s. He was the last American president born as a British subject. His father was a Virginia planter who served as a delegate to the Continental Congress and who signed the Declaration of Independence. For his schooling, he boarded with Robert Morris and entered the University of Pennsylvania in April 1791, where he studied medicine under Dr. Benjamin Rush, another Declaration of Independence signer, and William Shippen Sr. His father died in the spring of 1791, shortly after he began his medical studies. He was only 18, and Morris became his guardian. He also discovered that his family's financial situation left him without funds for further schooling. So he abandoned medical school in favor of a military career after being persuaded by Governor Henry Lee III, a friend of Harrison's father. On August 16, 1791, Harrison was commissioned as an ensign in the army in the 1st Infantry Regiment within 24 hours of meeting Lee. He was 18 years old at the time and was initially assigned to Fort Washington, Cincinnati in the Northwest Territory, where the army was engaged in the ongoing Northwest Indian War. Harrison was promoted to lieutenant after Major General Mad Anthony Wayne took command of the Western Army in 1792, following a disastrous defeat under Arthur St. Clair. In 1793, he became Wayne's aide-de-camp and learned how to command an army on the American frontier. He participated in Wayne's decisive victory at the Battle of Fallen Timbers on August 20th, 1794, which ended the Northwest Indian War. Harrison would go on to meet Anne Tuttle Sims of North Bend, Ohio in 1795 when he was 22. She was a daughter of Anne Tuttle and Judge John Cleve Sims, who served as a colonel in the Revolutionary War and a representative to the Congress of the Confederation. Harrison asked the judge for permission to marry Anna, but was refused. So the couple waited until Sims was left on business. They then eloped and were married on November 25th, 1791 at the North Bend home of Dr. Stephen Wood. Harrison began his political career when he resigned from the military on June 1st, 1798, and campaigned among his friends and family for a post to the Northwest Territorial Government. His close friend, Timothy Picker Pickering, was serving as Secretary of State, and he helped him to get a recommendation to replace Winthrop Sargent, the outgoing Territorial Secretary. President John Adams appointed Harrison to the position in July 1798. He also frequently served as acting territorial governor during the absences of the current governor, Arthur St. Clair. Harrison had many friends in the Eastern aristocracy and quickly gained a reputation among them as a frontier leader. He ran a successful horse breeding enterprise that won him acclaim throughout the territory. Congress had legislated a territorial policy which led to high land costs, and this became a primary concern for settlers. Harrison became their champion to lower those prices. The Northwest Territory's population reached a sufficient number to have a delegate in Congress by October 1799, and Harrison ran for election. He campaigned to encourage further migration to the territory, which eventually led to statehood. Harrison defeated Arthur St. Clair Jr. by one vote to become the Northwest Territory's first congressional delegate in 1798 at the age of 26. He served in the 6th United States Congress, and he had no authority to vote on legislative bills, but he was permitted to serve on a committee. He became chairman of the Committee on Public Lands and promoted the Land Act of 1800, which made it easier to buy land in the Northwest Territory in smaller tracts at a low cost. 
The sale price for public lands was set at $2 per acre, and this became an important contributor to rapid population growth in the territory. On May 13, 1800, President John Adams appointed Harrison as the governor of the Indiana Territory. Based on his ties to the West and seemingly neutral political stances, Harrison was caught unaware and was reluctant to accept the position until he received assurances from the Jeffersonians that he would not be removed from the office after they gained power in the upcoming elections. His, govern his governorship was confirmed by the Senate and resigned from Congress to become Indiana's first territorial governor in 1801. Harrison had wide-ranging powers in the new territory, including the authority to appoint officials and divide territory. One of his responsibilities was to obtain title to Indian lands that would allow further settlement. He was eager, eager to expand the territory for personal reasons as well, as his political fortunes were tied to Indiana's eventual statehood. Harrison had a pro-slavery position, which made him unpopular with Indiana's territory advocates as he made several attempts to introduce slavery into the territory. He was unsuccessful due to the territory's growing anti-slavery movement. In 1803, he lobbied Congress to suspend uh, Article 7 of the Northwest Ordinance for 10 years, a move that would allow slavery in the Indiana Territory. At the end of that period, citizens of the territories covered under the ordinance could decide whether or not to permit slavery. Harrison claimed that the suspension was necessary, but Congress rejected the idea. An Indian resistance movement had begun growing against American expansions throughout the leadership of, of Shawnee Brothers Tecumseh and another, his brother known as the Prophet. In a conflict that became known as Tecumseh's War, the Prophet convinced the tribes that they would be protected by the Great Spirit and no harm would befall them. He encouraged resistance by telling the tribes to pay white traders only half of what they owed and to give up all the white man's ways, including their clothing, muskets, and especially whiskey. In August 1810, Tecumseh led 400 warriors down the Wabash River to meet with Harrison in Vincennes. They were dressed in war paint, and their sudden appearance at first frightened the soldiers. The leaders of the group were escorted and where they met Harrison. Tecumseh insisted that the Fort Wayne Treaty was illegitimate, arguing that one tribe could not sell land without the approval of the other tribes, and he asked Harrison to nullify it, and warned that Americans should not attempt to settle the land sold in the treaty. Tecumseh informed Harrison that he had threatened to kill the chiefs who signed the treaty if they carried it out in terms, and that his confederation of tribes was growing rapidly. Harrison said that the, the Miamis were the owners of the land, and could sell it if they so choose. He rejected Tecumseh's claims. He said that each tribe could have separate relations with the United States if they chose to. And Harrison argued that the Great Spirit would not have made all the tribes speak one language if they were to be one nation. Tecumseh launched an impassioned rebuttal in the words of one historian, but Harrison was unable to understand his language. Shawnee friendly to Harrison cocked his pistol from the sidelines to alert Harrison that Tecumseh's speech was leading to trouble and some witnesses reported that Tecumseh was encouraging the warriors to kill Harrison. Many of them began to pull their weapons, representing a substantial threat to Harrison in the town, until a population of only a thousand. Harrison drew his sword, and Tecumseh's warriors backed down when the officers presented their firearms. Some of the chiefs were friendly to Harrison and countered Tecumseh's argument, and told the warriors that they should return to home in peace, since they had come in peace. Before leaving, Tecumseh informed that he would seek an alliance with the British if the treaty was nullified. Tecumseh was traveling in 1811 when Harrison was authorized by the Secretary of War to march against the Confederation. He led an army north to intimidate the Shawnee into making peace, but the tribe launched a surprise attack on December, uh, excuse me, November 7th in the Battle of Tippecanoe. Harrison defeated the tribal forces of Prophetstown next to the Wabash and Tippecanoe Rivers and was hailed as a national hero, and the battle became famous. However, his troops greatly outnumbered the attackers and suffered many more casualties during the battle. When reporting to Secretary of War, Harrison informed him that the battle occurred near the Tippecanoe River and that he feared an imminent reprisal attack. When no second attack came, the Shawnee defeat was more certain. The Secretary demanded to know why Harrison had not taken adequate precautions in fortifying his camp against attacks, and Harrison said that he had considered the position strong enough. The dispute was the catalyst of disagreement between Harrison and the Department of War. The press did not cover the battle at first, and one of hope Ohio paper misinterpreted Harrison's first dispatch to mean that he was defeated. By December, however, most major American papers 
carried stories on the battle, and public outrage grew over the Shawnee. Americans blamed the British for inciting the tribes to violence and supplying them with firearms, and Congress passed resolutions condemning the British for interfering in American affairs. Eventually, Congress declared war on June 18, 1812, and Harrison left Vincennes to seek a military appointment. After the war, Harrison was the Whig candidate and faced incumbent Van Buren in the 1840 election. He was chosen over more controversial members of the party, such as Clay and Webster, and based his campaign on his military record and on the weak U.S. economy. The Whigs nicknamed Van Buren Van Ruin in order to blame him for the economic problems. The Democrats, in turn, ridiculed Harrison by calling him Granny Harrison, the Petticoat General, because he resigned from the ar Army before the War of 1812 ended. They would ask voters what Harrison's name would be when spelled backwards, no Sirrah. They also cast him as a provincial, out-of-touch old man who would rather sit in his long cabin drinking hard cider than attend the administration of the country. However, the strategy backfired when Harrison and running mate John Tyler adopted the log cabin and hard cider as campaign symbols. The campaign used the symbols on banners and posters and created bottles of hard cider shaped like log cabins, all to connect the candidates to the common man. Harrison came from a wealthy slave-owning Virginia family, yet his campaign promoted him as a humble frontiersman in the style popularized by Andrew Jackson, while representing Van Buren as a wealthy elitist. An example of this was the Gold Spoon Oration that Pennsylvania's Whigs representative Charles Ogle delivered in the House, ridiculing Van Buren's elegant White House lifestyle and lavish spending. The Whigs invented a chant in which people would spit tobacco juice as they chanted, Whit Wirtz. And this also exhibited the difference between candidates from the time of the election. Whigs boasted of Harrison's military record and his reputation as the hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe. Campaign slogan Tippecanoe and Tyler II became one of the most famous in American politics. Harrison won a landslide victory in the Electoral College. 234 electoral votes to Van Buren's 60. Although the popular vote was much closer, he received 53%, while Van Buren 47% with a margin of less than 150,000 votes. Harrison's wife, Anna, was too ill to travel when, she, when he left Ohio for his inauguration, and she decided not to accompany him to Washington. When Harrison came to Washington, he wanted to show that he was still the steadfast hero of Tippecanoe, and that he was a better educated and more thoughtful man than the backwoods caricature portrayed in the campaign. He took the oath of office on Thursday, March 4, 1841, a cold and wet day, he braved the cold weather and chose not to wear an overcoat or a hat, rode on horseback to the ceremony rather than the closed carriage that had been offered him, and delivered the longest inaugural address in American history at 8,445 words. It took him nearly two hours to read, although his friend and fellow Whig, Dana Webster, had edited it for length. He became the first head of state to have his photograph taken, then rode through the streets in the inaugural parade and attended three balls that evening, including one entitled the Tippecanoe Ball, with 1,000 guests who had to pay $10 per person, equal to $297 today. On March 26, 1841, Harrison became ill with cold-like symptoms. His symptoms grew progressively worse over the next two days, at which time a team of doctors was called in to treat him. The prevailing misconception at the time was that his illness had been caused by the bad weather at his inauguration three weeks earlier. The doctors diagnosed him with right lower uh, pneumonia, then placed heated suction cups on his bare torso and administered a series of bloodlettings to draw out the disease. Those procedures failed to bring about improvement. So the doctors treated him with impiac, castor oil, chamomile, and finally with a boiled mixture of crude petroleum and Virginia snake root. All this only weakened Harrison further. Initially, no official announcement was made concerning his illness, which fueled public speculation. By the end of the month, large crowds were gathering outside the White House holding vigil while waiting any news about the president's con condition. Harrison died on April 4, 1841, nine days after becoming ill, and exactly one month after taking the oath of office. He was the first president to die in office. His last words were to his attending doctor, though assumed to be directed at Vice President John Tyler. Sir? I wish you to understand the true principles of the government. I wish them carried out. I ask nothing more. The White House hosted various public ceremonies modeled after European royal funeral practices, and an invitation-only funeral service was also held on April 7th in the East Room of the White House, after which 
Harrison's coffin was brought to the Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C., where it was placed in the public vault. Solomon Northrup gave an account of the procession in 12 Years a Slave. The next day, there was a great pageant in Washington. The roar of cannon and the tolling of bells filled the air, while many horses were shrouded with crepe, and the streets were black with people. As the day advanced, the procession made its appearance, coming slowly through the avenue, carriage after carriage, in long succession, while thousands upon thousands followed on foot. They were burying the dead body of Harrison to the grave. I remember distinctly how the window glass would break and rattle to the ground after each report of the cannon they were firing in the burial ground. That June, Harrison's body was transported by train and river barge to North Bend, Ohio, and he was buried on July 7th in a family tomb at the summit of Mount Nebo, overlooking the Ohio River, which is now the William Henry Harrison Tomb State Memorial. Harrison's death called attention to the ambiguity of Article 2, Section 1 regarding successions of the presidency. The Constitution clearly provided for the vice presidents to take over the powers and duties of the president, but it was unclear whether the vice president formally became president of the United States. Harrison's cabinet insisted that Tyler was vice president acting as a president. Tyler was resolute in his claim to the title of president and his de determination to exercise full powers of the presidency. Tyler obliged and was sworn in the office on April 6, 1841, and Congress convened in May and after a short period of debate, passed a resolution which confirmed Tyler as president. The precedent that he set in 1841 was followed on several occasions when an incumbent president died and was written in the Constitution in 1967 through Section 1 of the 25th Amendment. What then can we take away from William Henry Harrison? Well, unfortunately, not too much. Would Harrison have made a good president? president? Unknown. Did Harrison have a huge impact on life in the United States? Well, arguably, yes. His death, but it wasn't really because of anything that he did. His death, however, would set the stage for many famous vice presidents who would be elevated to president, including Theodore Roosevelt and Lyndon Baines Johnson. But just because his life didn't have a huge impact, does that mean he's unimportant? Does someone's life, even if it doesn't impact history, matter in the course of human history? What do you think? If you have more suggestions for weird biographies, go ahead and comment below with a person you'd like a biography on. And don't forget to like and subscribe to Mr. H on YouTube. Have a great day.